Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xiaobing Shen. Um, I'm, I'm from Ant. Unfortunately, my colleague Natasha is not feeling well today, so I will be your host today. My colleague Susanna is also host, co-hosting today's webinar with me. This webinar is part of a webinar series co-sponsored by ANTS and the Council of Australian University Libraries on theme of research data information integrations. Our previous three webinar has already covered the DMP tools, system managing ethics, and the data storage. The recording of these three webinars are available on ANTS YouTube channel. And today we will talk about the data publishing. First of all, we would like to acknowledge our co-sponsor, the Council of Austria University Libraries. We would like to thank them for their support. Secondly, we would like to say acknowledge Commonwealth Government for their support of ANTS and ANCRIS programs. So with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dom Hogan. Dom is from Saro Research Data Service Support Team, Information Management and Technology side. Today, Dom will talk about data publication at Saro. Dom, over to you. Uh, yeah, g'day everyone. Uh, thanks for having me along. Um, so, just to explain the broader context of data in CSIRO, um, I have this little slide here from what things looked like about 10 years ago, or maybe a little more than 10 years ago now, uh, and we had about 20 or so, or actually, okay, I've forgotten the count, but the, we had a number of different, um, what were called divisions at the time. And uh, each of these pretty much ran their own show. They got their, their portion of CSIRO's funding, and they had their own departments, they had their own libraries. Uh, and there was collaboration between divisions, and there was collaboration between the libraries. There was a, li a CSIRO library network. Um, but um, all in all, there, there, were very, there were varying standards of, um, of information management throughout the organization, just due to the nature that they were run separately. So around that time, uh, what happened is that there was a change to the formation of uh, information management and technology. And so this was one service for all of the divisions in CSIRO, um, which at the time included IT libraries and records. Uh, and that, was, uh, that allowed us to take a unified approach to, say, uh, data storage, um, networking, computer infrastructure. Uh, and so two of the things that came out of this uh, was the publications repository. So we were able to uh, merge our legacy publication citations and also have a unified uh, approval system for uh, new publications from 2009 on. And we also got working on uh, data.sara.au, which is uh, our uh, data repository. Now, as I said before, with, with those uh, many organizations that we had, had within the CSIRO, uh, some of them had very high data management standards and then others had well, yeah, much lower standards, not uh, due to the needs of the research. Um, so, the, yeah, the bringing in this uh, data repository, actually, uh, there there would have been some organisation, oh, some part of parts of CSIRO that actually felt that they had things pretty much under control and they weren't really in need of a new repository, uh, whereas other parts of the organisation had been really crying out for this sort of thing. Uh, so the goals with this uh, repository was to provide persistent access to data. Uh, and also version control. Uh, so this sort of enables the, um, the reproducibility of the scientific outputs uh, so that you can actually get down to individual versions of what you have. Uh, and the other goal there was um, self-service, which so we wanted uh, CSIRO researchers to be able to just log on and create their own data collections, write their own metadata. Um, now that's, uh, that can sound a bit scary, it's like can, uh, you know, we're, maybe researchers can be forced to write bad metadata. Um, so far what we found is that the people who are using it are the people who really want to use it and some sort of they want to get their data out there and so they usually uh, put the effort in to write fairly decent standard uh, metadata. And there's also an approval system in there so that uh, the approvers can go through and suggest uh, reviewers and uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of peer review that can go on there. And another goal in here was scalable storage. So as we have many, many terabytes or petabytes um, of data coming in towards us in the future, uh, the way to store this, so the, say maybe how things were done before, is you would have, um, a, let's say, a file server with as much disk space as you could put in there and files sorted however they happen to be. And um, there, there's an expectation that those files will be available to me right now. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to get them. Um, but that's a very expensive way to host data. 
uh, especially when you're getting into the petabyte scale. So what the, the DAP and what other parts of CIRA storage go in for is this, um, these different standards of storage categories so that uh, data that maybe need to be preserved but doesn't necessarily need to be accessed instantly at any given time uh, can sit on tape and then when it's requested it's loaded from tape onto disk where it can then be accessed. And so I've uh, taken this slide from Ian Corner and Renee Tighouse who uh, work in the storage area of CSIRO and this is, a, this is a bit of a model of their idea uh, of a, a scientific workflow where in, the, in our cloud, what we have here is, uh, are the various storage categories. And so the researchers don't need to think of the individual machines hosting any of this data. It's somewhat abstracted from them. All they have to do is uh, know what the address is, and then the storage team actually takes care of the rest. Uh, so they, they don't need to migrate between servers when there's an upgrade to the hardware. Uh, they can just keep pointing to the same address. And then you have these different storage categories like input, uh, you have the um, verified work and static. And so they are actually stored on different media with, uh, that are optimized for different uses. So the static reference data may be sitting on tape and then reloaded later on when we um, need to reprocess it. Uh, and you can also see that the, the idea in there is that as, the, as a project goes on, it would be moving the data through various quality control processes and, and eventually to publication. And the publication part, I guess, is where the data access portal comes in, but not always. Sometimes it can be a domain repository um, and then various parts of CSIRO have, the, have their own sort of ways of managing data. But we're trying to move towards uh, having one unified repository that at least catalogs uh, everything in CSIRO. Um, and we're, you know, we're making progress. So, the data access portal itself. Now, hopefully no one can read this because I realize there's a few errors in this diagram. <laughs> um, but what, um, what I'm trying to represent here is that the, the data access portal is not really just one system. It's actually a few systems that play together nicely. So uh, what we might have, I don't know if anyone can see my mouth, the mouse cursor here, but so with our SORA researcher, they're uh, entering metadata into the user interface and uploading, at the moment, uploading their data to an SFTB staging server, uh, which is all fairly straightforward and most researchers get that done without ever asking for any help. Uh, and then of course you've got a database that uh, stores this data or the metadata um, and also assesses the, the data files that come, comes in and records some uh, metadata about the files as well. And then that all gets sent off to this thing called the Logical Collection Manager. And what's happening there is uh, this is the thing that uh, takes in the requests for data or takes in the submissions for data and then decides what to do with it. So uh, if the data happens to be someone's requesting data from tape, so we have our research community and they're saying either asking the user interface or the web services interface for some data, then the logical collection manager is going, okay, well that's sitting on tape, I'm going to need that to load that off onto disk here uh, so that then some, somebody can then download it. And the thing about this tape is that the main um, delay that happens here is that the tapes themselves move data very fast once they're loaded. It's just the waiting for the robot to actually load the tape. So even for, say, a, a collection that is maybe hundreds of gigabytes, typically this will only take about you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, before somebody gets the notification saying, hey, here, here are the files you can start downloading. Uh, and then I also wanted to talk about some of the other systems that feed into this because uh, what we're discovering is that we're going to need to set up this sort of uh, what we're referring to as the data ecosystem. Um, so the, the various different uh, services and utilities that interact with each other to provide a, a broader network of uh, data capability. Um, <coughs> now here I've got this sort of big database store of SAP, that's our uh, organizational uh, information system, although I believe there's actually more to it than just SAP, uh, so take that with a pinch of salt. But anyway, that, so that's, that's one system, but it doesn't necessarily present the data for easy use by other systems. So what one of the teams in IMT have done is uh, create a series of different web services, which uh, just for developers really, I, I don't think there's much in the way of a, a user-friendly interface to any of this. Uh, that takes information from here and from other sources of CSIRO, so like the publications repository, uh, and um, formats that in a way that then any other, say, service or application in CSIRO can then use. 
So the data access portal uh, grabs our business unit information and our project information from SAP, but through these web services. So we don't really need to know how SAP works, we just need to know how these web services work. And um, yeah, they're, they're a really great piece of infrastructure that sort of sits underneath things. And uh, I, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the glory goes to the end applications that wind up doing great things with these, but these these basic web services are what support that uh, and enable that to happen. And so then once we're in, so this is just a screenshot of the um, organizational data uh, coming through to the data access portal. So the user is entering their information, they've selected their business unit, and then they select their team. Uh, and there's other information in there that goes so you, so you can get project information, information about who the project leader is, uh, and things like that. Uh, and, and of course, we could integrate more of that in the future. So for instance, there's uh, an interface to our publications repository, so we would be able to, it conceptually, uh, say, what other related publications pick from these, you're listed as an author, that sort of thing. Now another thing that happens here with the DAP is uh, we, we, we've got various different research groups that have already got metadata in their own systems, their own databases, and they wanted uh, to put these things in a repository. So these formed pilot projects. Uh, so we had the, a microscopy group. They have a very complex database and a lot of information about their um, microscopy images, uh, and they wanted to transfer that over. So they've got their own interface for doing that, uh, which sort of semi-automates the process. So they grab the system grabs the metadata out of their databases. Uh, and then gets the uh, the user to just polish up the record, fill in, finish off the complete uh, DAP collection record, and then they have it in the repository. And a similar thing goes on with the uh, the astronomy collection. So the first one we set up was the one for pulsar observation, and this represents a very large volume of data uh, that also gets used quite a bit uh, and internationally. So it's been quite a success, uh, and they also have very specific information about their radio astronomy data that uh, are that the, they have a custom search. And uh, a recent addition to this is the, uh, another set of uh, radio astronomy data. This is for the, um, from the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder project. So uh, I have a slide about that now. So this is just a sort of indication of the workflow um, that really extend, ends with one point in the data access portal, but there's a lot that happens before this. So you have these uh, antennas, and eventually there will be something like 32 of them, and they transfer a tremendous volume of data to what's called the correlator. Uh, in fact, this data, the volume of this data is really too big to actually store. Um, it, it would be extremely expensive to set up a supercomputer that could do that. So what this correlator does is that then compresses that data down into something that can be transferred to the, uh, the Pawsey Center, and that that data gets processed into what is actually stored. So rather than being, uh, I, I think at full capacity, it's going to be something like five petabytes a year. Um, I can't, I didn't write the number down, but it's a, it's, it's a truly scary volume of data that they're dealing with here. Um, so they crunch this down and then actually store what they're going to store in the data archive. And then they have several different ways of interfacing this. So they have their, what they call the CASDA application. So that's the CSIRO ASCAP Science Data Archive. And um, the astronomy community generally uses these virtual observatory tools, which are it's like programming interfaces to access the data, and they can query the data. And just uh, because you can't really download this volume of data, that would be crazy. Um, you, they use these programming interfaces to just query it for the data they are interested in. Um, but there's also uh, part of that is gone into the data access portal so that people that can just use that user interface there and also search for data and request just the small portions of data that they do want to actually download and use. And then this is another one of the systems that the data access portal interacts with. Uh, this one's, it's an open DAP sort of threads server and this is just one example of a, a fairly popular collection we have which is a, a hindcast of ocean waves. What, what they do is they create these NetCDF files, and the NetCDF files have embedded metadata. They have information about what fields they are, and we can see over here that we have um, information about the layer, what the units are in. There, there's a whole catalog of various different data sets stored this way, and the beauty of the OpenDAP services is that it provides various uh, methods of accessing the data that um, just by, by default. So here I've shown an example of the mapping service. This is just a running in my browser. But uh, in theory, uh, another spatial portal could just link to 
the data services that run on top of this and then access the data in their own mapping, custom mapping service for whatever purpose they happen to have in mind. And so what we have in the data access portal is a set of metadata for the collection at large uh, and that just points to these uh, open depth services. And uh, at the moment, we, we only have a handful of collections that use this, but they are very large. And then the hope is to um, improve this so that uh, any researcher can just point to an arbitrary open depth server and say, this is where my data is. Uh, and that could include um, you know, uh, services at NCI or other, other institutions. So uh, here, um, now oceans and atmospheres, this uh, used to be called uh, marine and atmospheric. Now they have their own metadata catalog for uh, quite some time. Uh, and they have their own data center with uh, various databases uh, and, and ways of accessing things. And what came up for them is that the, the new ship, the RV Investigator, uh, is collecting a lot more data than the previous vessels ever did uh, because it has a lot more instruments and higher resolution instruments. So they were looking for a way to store this data securely uh, and also minimize the problems of actually transferring that very large volumes of data over the network. So what we do is we grab metadata from their system. They can write it still using the way they're used to doing things. Uh, and they transfer the tapes to our system. And we can actually just plug those tapes straight into our tape library and it behaves like other DAP collections that have already been prepared. Um, and so what happens there is that they are able to share that with their university collaborators for the quality control process of the data that comes off the ship and then prepare that into data products that then go public. Now here's another example, Land and Water, that's a group within CSIRO, uh, and they also have had um, a very high standard of data management over the years. So they have this uh, metadata catalog that they use internally, and they use this through the working life of their project. So they have a, have a file server set up, and they have very strict naming conventions on their folders and files, and then they, um, as they go, they well, what, certainly what they encourage their researchers to do is to uh, write metadata, uh, this is just ANSLIC standard metadata in their system, and then what we've done is we've, uh, so for this one and for the marine and atmospheric one, we've enabled the ability to just basically upload the XML. So the, the, this, at the moment, that's ANSLIC or a marine community profile metadata can go in through here, and uh, when that's done, so this is just an example of one that's come through. So they've, that's created the, the DAP record. They can move their files in there and make that public, or they can just share it with uh, individual people. So we have uh, different restriction levels that we can add to different collections. Um, so we can restrict access to the files but leave the metadata public, or we can leave, um, restrict access to even the metadata. So there would be some collections in the system that I can't find, even as an administrator, because I'm restricted from accessing them. Uh, now, one thing, I'll just get back to this previous slide. So you'll see here that this one gets a DOI. Uh, and what's, uh, we've got some policies around what gets a DOI, what does not get a DOI. So for instance, this one, has restricted files. We can see our little padlock here on the files, and when we click on that, we get told, oh, you'll have to log on to access that. So this, for whatever reason, maybe commercial sensitivity or um, the licenses of source data, they aren't able to share this data. What they get is they get a handle uh, instead. Now, we are currently discussing amongst the team about maybe relaxing this so that metadata records can get a DOI. Uh, there's a little bit of debate going on there. Uh, but certainly the, the researchers would be very keen, um, a, a lot of researchers are very keen to use DOIs uh, as a preference for anything that they uh, cite. And then uh, this is an example, so this is a licensed data set, I didn't want to show one that I can't show to anybody because it's restricted, so this is just one that, that you can get through Geoscience Australia and we've got our own copy in there just available to CSIRO staff so that they don't have to go download it again. And so when we do that, we don't get a DOI and we don't get a handle. This is just using an internal ID system. Uh, and so this, this will only show up to CSIRO staff who log on. And then we've got version control. So uh, this is a bit of an example of a software collection that's been going through a few different versions. And uh, each time a new version gets created, uh, if it's a minor update, say just fixing a typo, then the DOI is uh, maintained. So you'll get several versions, but you'll only gets, but you won't get a new DOI. Uh, but in the instance where the data changes, so they, this is an actual new version of the software, 
Uh, and you can see that there are also subsequent versions that have new uh, contributors to the data. Um, so when those versions come through, so if they've changed something significant about these attribution statements, people in it, the title of the collection, they get a new version and they get a new DOI for each one. So what's in the future? Oh yeah, and one thing I have completely neglected to talk about is the, uh, the development we're doing of a um, data management plan tool. And so if we think back all the way to that uh, workflow where we were looking at, uh, I'm going to, no, I won't skip that, it's too many slides. The, um, when we think back to that workflow where we had the different categories of storage while researchers were working on their data before publication, this is, uh, they are starting to collect information about the files and information about what happens to those files as it goes. And uh, that combined with the data management plan tool where researchers uh, describe what they're planning to do and how they're planning to store things. Uh, we would like to get that metadata feeding into DAP collections so that they already have things written by the time they actually go to create the DAP record and there's less, so people maintain that metadata as they go, uh, so look, there's much lower transaction costs, as one of my colleagues says, um, when they're creating the metadata rather than uh, remembering everything right at the end. Another thing we're working on, uh, a number of research groups have been very keen on us setting up some features that would support linked data. So we've got semantic web features coming up, like uh, a persistent URL service, which is a generally useful thing. Uh, what we find is that a lot of researchers would want to uh, get DOIs, um, but they may not really understand the policies around using and maintaining DOIs. So they might think of a, UI, uh, a DOI as just a persistent URL that points at whatever you want it to point at, which is maybe more like what a Perl would be. So uh, there, I'm seeing a need, and certainly for linked data there's a need, to have persistent URLs that you can define the policies around. Uh, and so having an institutional-wide persistent URL service that both the data access portal could use, but that any uh, research group could use for tracking any object. It could be a person, it could be a data file, it could be a piece of software. Uh, and this would uh, lead in towards things like provenance tracking, where you can actually identify each Thing, each um, part of the process of the research workflow and record this uh, and then that should improve transparency and reproducibility of the research itself. Uh, we also are looking at vocabulary services because that will be uh, much, if, if for nothing else, uh, improving the way we enter keywords into our collections, but uh, there are numerous applications for vocabularies. And then, oh yeah, so the, the main thing about this semantic web features is not to have, say, we're going to implement this all in the data access portal um, because there are other parts of CSRO that would like to use these services. So things like that persistent URL service may be its own entity. Uh, so I think the thing that the researchers are really looking for is the persistence uh, and the, the reliability of it still being there in 10, 15 years time. Uh, and they want, um, so that, you know, they might be working on short-term projects, they may not be able to guarantee that sort of support for themselves, but uh, they're hoping that the organisation can support that and have that commitment to it. And uh, the other thing we're working on uh, with the web services interface is programmatic creation of collections, particularly for a data collection that is fairly routine. So we have, say, some geologists who are taking a lot of um, samples and scanning them, and they would like to just feed those scans and information about those scans straight into a data collection that they, they can then reuse uh, later. And so rather than manually going through and creating it each time, which um, is really infeasible at the moment, having a program that can do that for you, uh, that's what they're, they're looking for. And so we're in a testing phase of that right now. And so I can't get through this without acknowledging the support of the Australian National Data Service, who funded quite a lot of the development of the DEP. And uh, also, that I took one of those slides from Ian Connor and Renee Tyhouse from their presentation at eResearch last year. There is a cast of thousands that have worked on this over the years, uh, and this is by no means all of them. Um, <laughs> these are just a few people that I'm working with uh, lately. Um, so thank you to them, and uh, thank you for listening in. Do we have any questions? Yes, Dom, we thank do. You, Dom. There's a couple of questions here. What do you use for project IDs? Is there a national service? No, we're just using internal identifiers for projects. So this is really just, um, they're, they're probably codes that wouldn't make much sense outside of CSIRO. Uh, that's why I didn't really go into a huge amount of detail about that. 
So I, I guess uh, there's certainly for projects that do have that sort of national scope, there's no reason why that couldn't be set up. But at the moment, it's really uh, codes that are sort of specific to how SAP works. There's also a comment from the same person who says that they're pushing ORCID to supply these. I'm not quite sure that would work as ORCID is pretty much just a person identifier as far as I remember. Uh, yeah, well that's definitely on the list of things that we're trying to implement. So we want uh, to register ORCIDs. And because it's an opt-in thing, we can't just say, hey, everyone in CSIRO, here's your ORCID. Uh, they have to actually volunteer for that. But um, yeah, we, we, we definitely want to link ORCIDs from both CSIRO researchers and external collaborators who are listed into records. Uh, that, that, those are one of the identifiers that I think would be very useful. Um, and so when I was talking about persistent identifier services, you know, to, to, to fill in gaps because there are all types of, say, objects that um, would could benefit from this that might not be covered by uh, an internationally recognised service. The next question is, what is the policy you mentioned around DOIs? Is it publicly available? I'm not quite sure what means. Is the policy publicly available or whether the data is publicly available? Okay, so the policy on DOIs, uh, I'm probably going to have to pass the buck on this, but um, I, I believe we can share it. I'm not sure if we've got it. I don't know if I could point to a website that hosts it at the moment. Um, so I'd either, well, I, yeah, I'll pass the buck to one of my colleagues. If, if I can get a, you to take a name down for that, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to get back to you. Yeah, so um, and back then, to, she's come back to say it is the policies that she wants to have shared. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I believe that is actually part of uh, our, if Sue Cook is in here, um, you could pass control over to her and, or give her a voice. I think she's got some comments to make about this. She has she made a comment that says the CSIRO DOI business rules are on the ANS website. Oh, there you go. Okay. And others yeah, have asked the policy too, so they are on the ANS website. Okay, another question is, are there are any of the open DAP components available for other research institutions to implement or use? Uh, yeah, I believe open debt, I don't think we have a custom implementation of that. Um, I'm, that's actually managed by um, a sort of a data, data services team in CSIRO who are linked to the high performance computing team. Uh, so I don't, I'm probably going to guess that none of them are in this webinar. But uh, yeah, as I understand, I, I believe that's some open software that they have implemented there. So I don't think there's anything special about what we've done. Certainly, I know the um, uh, Nectar or the NCI have some threads servers going, and I'm sure the Bureau of Meteorology do too. So uh, I, I don't think there's anything particularly novel there. Uh, may, maybe there's a few implementation details, but uh, I can definitely put you in touch with um, Gareth Williams, who would be uh, more than happy to talk about that. <laughs> um, Jerry's made a comment, Jerry Ryder, who's from ANS, she says, with regards to pearls for projects, ANS has a service for ARC and NHMRC grants. Okay, and I think for the moment that's all of the questions that have come in. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, thanks Dom.